Okay, we got Isaac in. We got Jake Kennedy. We got Ryan Power. Uh, just missing uh, one point, maybe. Uh, the the California spec is just for the emissions protocol. So pretty much once you start tuning on it, um, you can you have all the same features that non-California spec uh, has. It's just a matter of <clears throat> excuse me. It's a matter of just like ditching the cat, turning off the de all that kind of stuff, uh, the different engine check functions and whatnot. But because the the PCM file is different, that's why you have to when you connect the cob, it asks you is it a federal one or a California spec one. It's just two different types of uh, firmwares, but they tune the same way. Yeah, Isaac, there won't be any issues once you once you start tuning. I'm trying to figure out who do we not have yet. Yeah, other than the altitude thing, you uh, should be good to go. Having technology issues here. Did, uh, did Eric take off? He goes one? No, he's right there. Oh. Oh, really? Yeah. My house? Yeah, I just I did the DIY for the I don't know, I thought it worked pretty well. I don't know. Oh, yeah. I like the idea of entertaining all of 
So we're just missing oil meter here. Yeah, very uh, Team, you were thinking driving me crazy. Uh, I think I'm missing one, one maybe two. Ignition, um, the DIY fuel mounts, um, racing beats, both. Just missing one then. Waiting on one. Yeah. 
Mm-hmm. <laughs> it still smells not a bad smell. Hang on, man. Sorry, we're struggling here. lost one i'm gonna have to try and figure it out um let's go ahead and continue okay let me re see if i can refine them I don't know how he just dropped off like that. All right. Well, in the interest of continuing to, to drive on, let's uh, keep going. Hopefully, he'll uh, ping me back via IM or something. Um, if uh, one of you guys that have access to the Internet, just keep an eye on the uh, RX-8 Club for me. And uh, chime in if, if he's trying to get help via the forums or whatnot and see if we can lend him a hand and get him back on here. All right, so. Oop. 
Good question, Isaac. I'm not sure. Let's see if I have it in my email. I'm not sure what his forum name is. I won't be in there. Too, we got too much technology going on. Seventy one dash six one zero dash five three zero. So everybody should have as their meeting ID. Yeah. I don't have like a lot of I think it... <laughs> All right, so if you guys keep an eye on the forums, and like I said, just interrupt me if we can figure out where he went off to. I feel really bad if he's uh, not able to reconnect. I'm just not sure where he went off to. Doesn't even say he's offline, which is pretty weird. But if we can get him back, uh, yeah, I guess he will get the recording. Okay, well, let's keep on keeping on then. All right, so now we've kind of got a good conceptual uh, arms wrapped around all of the uh, general engine stuff. Are there any? Is anybody completely lost in the sauce at this point? Are we all tracking pretty good? What? Yeah, Eric doesn't count. You're allowed to be dazed and confused. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay, so we've all got a good general conception. Uh, the next thing we're going to do before uh, we kind of move into the specific tuning stuff is we're going to actually talk about the, the math and how, how it works, okay? So injector math. The two things you want to consider is duration and duty cycle, okay? Um, you got it up on your screen. You should be able to read all this long-winded stuff. But when you are at 100% duty cycle, meaning that your injector is open the entire available time, then the solenoid that holds the injector back never gets a break, and it will end up overheating. So you don't want to run your fuel system at 100% for very long because that solenoid will overheat. But 100% duty cycle means that the amount of duration, the amount of time that it can be open, it is open. Okay, the duration is based on the RPM. So if you see here where I got calculate duration, it's 60 times 1,000 divided by RPM for a rotary. You have to take that number and times it, multiply it by two for a piston because pistons have a dead stroke, right? They have a power stroke and a dead stroke. So that, that's milliseconds available. So at uh, 9,000 RPMs, I want to say there's something like 6.6 .6 milliseconds available. I have to redo the math. I'm pretty sure it's what it is off the top of my head. Uh, 
60,000 times or divide by him. 9, 9, 9, Yep, so it's, yeah, 6.66 milliseconds is what's available at 9,000 RPMs. That's, that's the duration. So the duration is a measurement of time. It's absolute. You know, there's, there's no variables or anything to it. The duty cycle is what percent of that, say, 6.6 .6 milliseconds of duration is the injector actually open. So if it's open for half of that, you're at 50% duty cycle. If it's half it, if it's open for you know three quarters of that, you're at 75 and so on. Okay. The cob reports both duration and duty cycle. So you can monitor these things. And the goal when you're starting to make power is you want to make sure that you're calculating and realizing that your injectors may get to a point where they get above 80, 90 percent duration or duty cycle, in which case you want to start thinking about bigger injectors. Okay. Now different tuning softwares you will actually have to put in the duty cycle and duration that you want. Most of your standalones, that's how they work. You tell it at 5,000 RPMs and this engine load, I want my injector open for 5.8 milliseconds or 47% duty cycle or whatever. With the Cobb and some of the newer generation stuff, we have the advantage of putting in our target AFR and our injector size, and then the computer does all the math for us. So that's a good thing, but we still want to basically know how this works. All right, we'll skip that. Okay. Now for the real fun stuff. The, when we're talking about forced induction, we need to be able to read uh, compressor maps, okay? This is how, how we do it. And don't worry, I'll give you guys all copies of the PowerPoint so you have this uh, slide available to you as well. But basically, what you got is the pressure ratio of your compressor, whether it's a turbo or a supercharger or whatever, is equal to the pressure it's creating, boost, minus if whatever pressure drop is across your system, right? So your turbo might be pushing 12 PSI, but by the time it makes it into your engine, it's just 10 PSI. And that's based on, you know, friction and cooling and all other stuff. Plus the ambient pressure divided by the ambient pressure. It creates a pressure ratio, right? So your pressure ratio might be 1.5, it might be 1.7, it just all depends, right? But you do that math. Then you take your ideal temperature out. Remember we talked about the gas law? If you create pressure, what else do you create? Temperature, right? So your ideal temperature is based on just the heating. Um, oh, Ryan asked the pressure drop. You can put two manual pressure sensors into your system to measure it, or uh, the general rule of thumb is between two and three psi for a pretty efficient intake track. But the only way to do it for sure is to actually put two pressure sensors, one right behind the throttle body and one at your uh, turbo outlet. The ideal temperature is the ideal temperature based on the heating from just compression, right? 100% efficient system, just compressing the air. And that is your temperature in plus 460 times the pressure ratio to the 0.283 power minus 460. The actual temperature is that ideal temperature minus the temperature in divided by the efficiency. Okay, so if your ideal temperature is the compression heats it by, say, 100 degrees, if you're 80% efficient, it's going to heat it by 120-ish degrees, right? It's a little, little different than that, but I'm chewing from the hip here. You're going to have that extra latent heating. It has nothing to do with compression. It just has to do with an inefficient system by which we are compressing our air. That allows you to figure out your density ratio, which is the pressure ratio times the temperature in plus 460 divided by the temperature out plus 460. Right? That temperature out is the is not the ideal one. Uh, oh, it's in. Uh, Kelvin. That's where the plus 460 comes from, is converting it to Kelvin. All of the, the measurements would be in Fahrenheit. 
if you had Celsius, you'd have whatever the different conversion factor is to get it to Kelvin for this math. All right, so the pressure ratio is basically, the density ratio is the pressure ratio modified by our temperature change. Okay, so we have that information. So now you have your density ratio. Then you got to figure out your engine displacement, which is number of cylinders times stroke times bore squared divided by 1.27, which is very easy for us because we already know it. 1.3 liters, right, or, or 80 cubic inches. In this case, we're going to use 80 cubic inches. So the volumetric flow rate that that engine is capable of at 100% efficiency is the displacement multiplied by the RPM divided by 1728 for a rotary, okay? Uh, 3456 if you're using a piston, because again, they have a dead stroke, not as efficient as a rotary. Your volumetric, your actual volumetric flow rate is the volumetric flow rate at 100% multiplied by the VE, right? So if you're 100% efficient, it's the same. But if you're only 80% efficient or 90, et cetera, et cetera, right, you got to adjust for that. Then you figure out your mass flow rate without boost, which is 2.703 times pressure at the ambient times the volumetric flow rate divided by the temperature of the ambient air temperature plus 460. Then you take that mass flow rate uh, naturally aspirated, right? You take that number and multiply it by the density ratio, which now we're talking about our compressed air. Okay. And then your horsepower, brake specific horsepower, uh, is mass flow rate times 60 divided by the air fuel ratio times the brake specific fuel consumption, which is a measurement of how efficient your engine is at converting fuel into power. And rotaries are not as good as pistons at this. So we're like at the 0.6 area, whereas pistons are 0.7 or sometimes even 0.8. We're very fuel inefficient cars. So we can make less horsepower per amount of fuel consumed. What's that? <laughs> they use lots of fuel efficiently, yeah. Um, so now and then on this horsepower calculation, you can do a general rule of thumb, which is mass flow rate times 10, to give you an idea. So if you're moving 40 pounds per minute of air, you can guesstimate that you're making about 400 horsepower at the uh, flywheel. So and it's a, and again, it's a rule of thumb with the guesstimation. There's not, it, there's other things, drive shaft and gearing and everything else that impact that. All right. That all being said. We have now have our mass flow rate at forced induction, <coughs> excuse me, at a different RPMs, right? You're going to do all this math for more than one RPM. All right, so we determine what our boost goal is, right? What, how many PSI we want our turbo to produce. Then you get your pressure ratio and your density ratio. Then you ma figure out your mass flow rate for various RPMs. So we're going to use a, a rotary a Renesis at 13 PSI on a 2871R turbo. That's going to, for our example here. So we do all that crazy math again. See how I've got it there? The mass flow rate at 9,000 RPMs is 2.703, blah, 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 blah. Okay, 49 pounds per minute of air. And then yeah, I've got everything else down below it kind of measuring, okay? So... Let's see, how many PSI did I use? 13 PSI? Okay, so in a 100% efficient system, if your turbo can produce 13 PSI at 9,000 RPMs, the engine will generate 49 pounds per minute of air, which is roughly somewhere in the 450 horsepower range, right? That's assuming that you have a turbo that's efficient enough to do it, Right, and that your engine is efficient enough to do it. Right, so this is all ideal state. And what I'm going to show you next is you guys will start to see where this whole turbo sizing thing becomes an issue. 
So this combination, theoretically, should be able to get us to a uh, 450 horsepower goal, right? Using that rule of 10 as a rule of thumb. Okay, now watch what we have here. Let's start compressor map. Now notice my 1,000 and 2,000 are blue, right? And the reason why those are blue is because the engine exhaust is not enough to get the turbo to generate 13 PSI, right? It's not spinning fast enough. So I'll show you how to modify those in a second. And we got 3,000, 4,000, 5,000, 6,000, and I went ahead and just skipped over to 9, okay? Now here's your problem. You see how the efficiency map of our turbo goes up and to the right? Okay? Our engine does not go up and to the right. So at 9,000 PSI, you're way over there. There's no way that that turbo can make 13 PSI at, at uh, 9,000 RPMs, that, that volumetric flow rate. And here, this is the issue that we have with turbos, okay? Turbos, as you can see from the shape of this curve, turbos are generally designed to remain efficient, creating more and more boost for the appropriate mass flow rate, more and more pressure. So they want to create more and more pressure to create that mass flow rate. That's why they they kind of lean over to the right a little bit. You can't we there's no turbo flow map like that that lays down on the side pretty much. Okay, so then we adjust our line here, a best fit, and you see that I drop the 1,000 into the 2,000. So what you have to do is you go back in, and when you look at those uh, mass flow rates for the engine at the lower RPMs, you have to compare the AR trim, which is the backside, the hot side of the turbo, with those mass flow rates to get an idea of how fast that thing is even going to be spinning. If it's not fully spun up yet, you're not going to get your 13 PSI. So we already know this turbo is not going to be a good fit because we, not, we can't go past 6,000 RPMs with it. It'll just start to fall off, okay? The way we tell that for the 1,000, 2,000 is this is your AR trim map. So you notice here... Uh, I forget what the pressure ratio was. It was uh, 1.5-ish, I think we were looking at, the pressure ratio. I have to go back. But if you look here at your uh, gas turbine flow pounds per minute, remember, this is hard for people to get their head wrapped around, but we didn't create any new mass inside of the engine. Right? Nothing new happened. We didn't create anything. So the amount of air going in is equal to the amount of exhaust going out, right? It doesn't, doesn't seem like it should make sense, but we have this big explosion inside the engine. But the reality is, is that the mass going in is the same as the mass going out. It's hotter. It's moving faster, but it's still the mass going in, the mass going... Otherwise, we have nuclear fusion, right? It's not happening inside the engine. So nothing new can be created inside of this engine. So we look at the mass flow rate at our 1 and 2,000 RPMs. When we did that math earlier. If it is less than 14-ish pounds per minute of air, can we get a 1.5 pressure ratio? No, you can't spin the turbo fast enough, right? So that's how you can kind of war game where what they call your boost threshold is. What RPMs can you actually get boost? Okay, so you have, there's our two limiting factors. What RPMs can we carry boost to? And then you look at your AR trim to say what, what RPM can we get boost? You can't get boost at 1,000 PS, uh, RPM. You can't get boost. You can't get 13 PSI at 2,000 RPM. Right? What can you get? Uh, 2,000 is 11 pounds per minute. So at 2,000, you're looking at, you know, just just starting to boost, right? So 2,000 is right around the boost threshold, but you're not actually at 13 PSI yet. You're probably maybe like right around ambient 1 PSI-ish, somewhere right around there, okay? So there you go. There's, there's the magic of sizing a compressor. And a supercharger works the same way, except you don't have this AR trim because there is no AR trim. It's being powered by the engine. Um, and you're just looking for, if you're, if you're shopping different turbos, you know, what you're looking for is the one that is the most efficient 
at your RPM. So that top of that island there is 74% efficient. That's you know where you'd want to be ideally, which we know can't really happen. But you surely don't want to be off the map. That's really your, your main problem with this particular snail, is that you're not even on the map at 9,000 RPM. And so, <clears throat> excuse me, what driving this car with this turtle on it, what it would net result in is after 6,000 RPMs, the boost would just start to fall off. That's what it would look like and feel like in the car when you're driving. You, you, you see the boost gauge go boop, up to 13 and hang out at 13, and then it'll start slowly falling. And that's the problem they're having with the Gretties, right? Is they can't hold 10 PSI to red line, or they can't hold 11 PSI to red line, or whatever. Because the factory Gretti turbo will just pass 6 or 6,500, 7,000 RPM. It'll just, it'll be, the engine's taking in more air than what the turbo can produce. Okay, any questions on. Turbo sizing. Anybody online? We got a participant one. Someone just oop, what'd I do? Okay. Did we get uh somebody back here? What happened? That uh Antavius? Hello. Uh. Okay. Well what's his real name? Antavius is back. Alright, so everybody's good now? Oh, we lost 1.3. All right, let's bring him back. All right, we got everybody back now. I think that's uh, Antavius, right? Yep, participant one is Antavius. So everybody's here. I think we're good. Sorry for all the drama. I don't know exactly what happened, but um, can everybody still hear me? Yep, yep, yep. Everybody can see the screen. All right, uh, I'm going to recap real, real fast for Antavius just to make sure, because I know you missed it, and I feel bad about whatever technological drama is going on. Um, so bear with me while I just recap real quick. Antavius, what we did while you were gone, bud, is uh, we did this math, and I'll give you a copy of the PowerPoint so you'll be able to, to follow with it. But all this crazy math right here, all it's really doing is determining how much air moves in and out of an engine at different RPMs, okay? Once we figure out how much air is moving, that gives us our horsepower as well as our airflow requirements for any kind of forced induction, turbo, supercharger, etc. okay? And then we take that math and we do it on our engine at different RPMs. The BSFC is brake specific fuel consumption, which is the amount, it's basically how fuel efficient the car is. The amount of horsepower generated by one pound per fuel burned inside the engine. And so rotaries are very fuel inefficient, so it takes us more air and more fuel to make an equivalent amount of horsepower as a piston engine. So then we figure all this stuff out. Okay, here's our our math done for us and this tells us what how many pounds per minute of air is going through our engine at different rpms and then we can take that information and get a turbo flow map which tells us how efficient our turbo is and line it up and we see here that at 9000 rpms this particular turbo 
it's off the chart. This turbo cannot create enough air for us at 9,000 RPMs. And then I draw this line here for the 1,000 and 2,000 because we know that the turbo is not spinning fast enough to generate our desired 13 PSI. So you're not actually making any boost yet. Okay, and you can figure that out by using this AR trim, and it shows you how many pounds per minute of air going through the engine it's going to take to create boost. And in this case, if you want to create 1.5 pressure ratio, right, one and a half atmospheres of boost, you got to be moving about 14 pounds per minute of air. All right, that was the short version. Did I totally lose you, Antavius, or are you, are you with me? All right, cool. Moving on. All right, so the next issue we run into is packaging constraints, right? You got to uh, take into account how big it is, how much room you have to, to do it, um, et cetera, et cetera, okay? Uh, one thing I do want you guys to always remember and you'll hear this theme. You've heard it all morning. You're here all day. Street cars are not race cars. We, every time we do one of these modifications, we're trading something for something. You can trade your low-end uh, horsepower for some high-end horsepower. You can trade some high-end horsepower for some low-end horsepower. But you can't net create new horsepower out of nothing. You can do forced induction to give you more power, but there's a trade for that. You have more engine wear, more heat you got to get rid of, et cetera, et cetera. It's easy to build a race car because a race car does one thing, whatever that is. Right? I need to build a drag car. I'm going to take this engine and this car, shove as much horsepower in it as I possibly can, bada bing, bada boom, it's now my drag race car. It won't turn for shit. It won't, you know, won't slow down. Got to put a parachute on it because it doesn't have any brakes. But it does what it does. Now, building a street car, you want a car that's going to, you know, handle well, be reasonably fast, stop on a dime, yada yada yada. It's just something you have to keep in mind. You're always going to be making these types of compromises. You don't want to deal with the hot exhaust issue of a turbo. Then get a supercharger. But if you get a supercharger, you're making that trade. I'm going to have parasitic engine loss from my drive belt, and I'm going to have very, very hot air because superchargers are not as efficient as turbos are as far as air temperature is concerned. But I'm willing to trade that to not have hot exhaust and vice versa, right? All these things are all part of the, the process, okay? <laughs> so for your build, you have to think about it and kind of decide, you know, which one is better. An all-motor build, nitrous oxide, turbo, supercharger, right? It's just based on where you're at. You guys already kind of said you were looking at doing turbos. Um, well, you already bought one, but supercharger. Now you're, you were leaning supercharger before, right? And you're still kind of in the supercharger camp. Uh, anybody online want to chime in with uh, if this changed their mind about anything? Nope, okay. Moving right along. Okay, if you decide to, uh, obviously, if you're going to build versus buy, um, you got to take into consideration that you won't have any kind of base map to fall back on, which for rx 8s there's not really much in the base map world anyway, so I guess it's not less of an issue for us than most people. you got to take into account price, build quality, aftermarket support, um, my favorite is how anal are you. I'm extraordinarily anal retentive. So every, not even every kit, every car I've ever bought in or owned, I didn't like the way that something was built on it. Probably the, my vehicle that I like the most is my Jeep Wrangler because there's nothing to it. Like 1993, my dad bought it brand new and it's been our family ever since. All of the maintenance has been done meticulously on it, right? And there's just not a lot of stuff to get pissed off about it. But, you know, even my RX-8, every time I got underneath it, I was like, I got to replace all these bolts with some stainless steel ones because this one's corroding and blah, blah, blah. So, you know, I'm one of those guys. I'll end up building my own 
uh, Factory 5 Cobra is my next goal after I finish my school. Um, and it, it's solely so that I can build a car the way that I want to build it. Right? All stainless steel or titanium bolts, I'm going to spend a fortune, but it'll be built the way that I want it to be built. So if you're angle retentive, you might want to think about the build process versus the buying. You know, even if you can't do all the fabrication yourself, you can take it to somebody and have them like just do the manifold and get it done exactly the way that you want it and coded with what you want it to be coded with, et cetera, et cetera. And then obviously buying, you get whatever they give you, and if you don't like it, you replace it. So sometimes you buy a kit and end up replacing half the parts. All right, so we talked about uh, brake specific fuel consumption. You guys asked me about it, so here you go. I'll give you a minute to kind of read it. Um, there you go. Basically, how fuel efficient it is at turning fuel into power. All right, and then we also know that anytime we add force induction, we reduce the reliability to some degree, right? Now, is it going to blow two days later? No. Well, maybe. Hopefully not. Um, but you have to, there will be some sort of longevity hit that you're going to take by adding all of this heat and power to your engine system. Um, it's also no different than if you add a uh, higher red line, right? A shaft of any kind sitting on a bearing of any material spinning at 10,000 RPMs is going to wear it out faster than that same shaft spinning at 5,000 RPMs. That's just the way it goes. Okay. So we kind of covered all the basics. Um, you guys ready to rock and roll on some uh, actual tuning stuff? We'll go through these slides here, and then we'll take a, a fairly short uh, lunch break um, or some kind of break where I can get some sort of food. Whatever you guys, whatever time zone you're in, you can call whatever you want. But uh, and then we're actually going to get into some of the hands-on stuff, okay, with the cob. So important terms to know: AFR and lambda. AFR is the air-fuel ratio. Okay, so 12 to 1, 13 to 1, etc. Uh, Lambda is the same thing based on a ratio of stoichiometric. So a lambda of one. Oh, hang on a second. Ryan had a question. Uh, yes. You are correct, Ryan. BFSC is how many gas pounds per hour per horsepower produced. So it's a measure of an engine's fuel efficiency at making power. Um, so a lambda of one is 14.7 AFR. A lambda lower than one is richer and higher than one is leaner than 14.7. That's how that works. I, it's much like the metric system. It logically makes sense to me. I understand it. Intuitively, I cannot read lambda. I just have never been able to. So if someone tells me, I'm running at 0.87, I'm like, cool, man. I have no idea what that means. You tell me... You're running at 12.1. Got it. And intuitively, in my head, I understand what that means. So that's just me. Other people, I'm sure, are differently. Lambda. How many feet are in a mile? Yeah, nobody knows that. Well, you know, to be an army guy, I will admit that when I'm doing like overland movements, kilometers, meters, got it. But and I like it when wrenching. It's nice. Hey, my 10 millimeter wrench doesn't fit. Guess what? The next wrench I'm gonna grab. The 11 millimeter wrench, <laughs> not these. Oh, my, yeah, my 716 is too big, so I now got to find the 916 is half an inch. You know, yeah, I got it. Do you use MOA or MRAD then? MOA. So easier. Yeah, it's I said it's a lambda thing, man. I got it. Um, uh, lambda means I just that's what it meant again. Lambda means what percentage the engine is currently running based on stoichiometric, which is, stoichiometric is 14.7. Stoichiometric is the most efficient, yes, the stoichiometric is the most efficient AFR, meaning the most air meets with the highest amount of fuel. Okay. 
And we'll talk about that in just one second as far as deviating from, from uh, stoichiometric and why we do it. But there's just the two terms. So if you someone says AFR and someone says uh, lambda, et cetera, that's just it's the same thing. Whatever format you're, you're reading it in, okay? Um, timing, we have two terms, advanced and retarding. Advancing timing means that we are igniting the air-fuel mixture sooner in the engine cycle. Retarding means we're doing it later in the engine cycle, okay? Um, 12 to 15 degrees after top dead center is the greatest point of mechanical advantage. So if you just think about the, the whole levering factor, right? If top dead center means that the whole rotor face is smooshed directly this way. So if I had, that was my point that I was going to push down really hard, it wouldn't go where I want it to go, right? But if you let it rotate over a few degrees and then I push really hard on it, it's going to create that torque that we want, okay? And the same thing works on a piston engine because you have to rotate the rod, right, past the crankshaft a little bit. So that's your, your greatest point of mechanical advantage. So if you can create the highest comp uh, chamber compression pressure at 12 to 15 degrees after top dead center, that engine will make the most power that it's physically able to make at that RPM. And uh, the question that we had, uh, I got a bunch of questions here. Okay, uh, we'll talk about ideal timing on stuff later. We are going to go over how to do calculating timing, yes. Um, and the air-fuel ratio is not of the intake charge. The air-fuel ratio is once the two mix and they're inside the combustion chamber. They're inside the rotor. And degrees is the actual angular measurement of the crankshaft. That is correct. 360 degrees of rotation, right? So zero degrees is at the top, and you one degree, so on and so on. 45 degrees is, or 90 degrees rather, is at your, you know, right angle. All right. Hopefully we don't have any other questions, or if you do, just type them out in the chat thing, guys. Do you guys have any questions? Yes. So at 12 degrees past dead center, whatever mm -hmm. would that is dead center the point at which you have the highest compression, though? Dead center is the point where you have the highest compression. Yeah. But so you're, if you're pushing, yeah. well, remember when I talk about compression or chamber, plus chamber pressure, I'm talking about the expansion of it, right? Yeah. The top dead center is when it has the highest compression. Yeah. But past that, once you light off the charge, you want it to expand. Higher pressure. Yeah, higher pressure, yeah. But the reason why you don't ever, you don't want the highest pressure to be at top dead center is solely because the mechanics of the engine will not allow it to to rotate and to move right. Um, so you want it to be a little bit past there, then you want your maximum pressure. Now, unfortunately, it's not super easy to intuitively know exactly when you're hitting that 12 to 15 degrees because you have to calculate. And I've been doing literally I've been working on this for almost 10 years now, and I haven't I haven't figured it out yet. But I will. You have to calculate how fast the flame speed is, right, based on the increasing volume per degree of crank angle rotation, based on the cooling of the charge now that you're starting to move away, right, versus the heating of the charge when you're coming close together. How long does it take the spark plug to ignite? Then you have what's called your, uh, your uh, laminar flame speed and your bubble flame speed, and they're different. And then you have what's called quench, from the extra fuel that's out there cooling it as it becomes vaporized and stuff. So it, there's just all these variables short of having a pressure-inducing spark plug, which they do make very expensive. Um, you don't know for a fact if you're getting your maximum cylinder pressure at that 12 to 15 degree top dead center mark. So you can use a dyno to do timing. You can do some math and get you pretty close. Those are really your only two options at this point in time. Uh, okay, crankshaft. Yeah, okay, it would be, yes, it's the angle of the rotor in regard to the top dead center, um, meaning that because ours is 90 degrees off to the right side, top dead center is when the rotor is at its highest point of compression. So it's not 
north and south, it's more east and west, top and bottom center on a, on a rotary, because ours, our combustion chamber's on the side, right? Not on top, like a piston engine. Yes, but it's still a top, it's still considered top dead center. Okay. It would be the angle of the rotor in regard to top dead center. Ryan's asking some questions. So, yes, the rotor is what we care about. Top dead center, most compression. We, and then when we're talking about advancing retarding time, we're talking about it in degrees of rotor rotation, not in degrees of eccentric shaft rotation. Okay, uh, so keep going with some terms here. We have exhaust gas temperature. Okay, that's the measurement of how hot the exhaust is coming out of the engine. Uh, we have injector flow rate, which is the size of the injector. Okay, we also have, we talked about duration and duty cycle, and we talk about scaling. When we scale injectors in the cob, the, the number that's in the cob access port is not a direct measurement of that injector. It's just what they call a scalar value, meaning that it is whatever it is. It's 467 for the secondary and the P2 injectors. Does that mean that they're 467 CC injectors or 467? No, it just means they're 467. So if they're 10% too small or 10% too big, you just modify that number. It's not a direct, I just can type in, I went and bought 1,000 CC injectors, so I'm going to go in there and type 1,000. It doesn't work that way. So when we talk about scaling for injectors or uh, we talk about scaling injectors, uh, that's what we're talking about, the deviation. We're scaling anything, mass airflow, sensor, et cetera. And whenever time you scale something, you're simply modifying it by a percent to change your observed values to be in line with your, your actual measured values. Uh, Ryan had a question, uh, clarify advance is to decrease the degrees to top dead center and retard is to increase. I'm not really sure what you mean, but I'll, let me answer it this way. If you're igniting your ignition at zero degrees top dead center and you want to advance the ignition, you're going to light it at 10 degrees before top dead center. If you're going to retard it 10 degrees, you would then ignite it 10 degrees after top dead center. So when you see a positive value in your map, that is before top dead center. When you see a negative value, that is after top dead center. That answer your question, Ryan? Other way around. Advancing would mean 10 plus 5. Retarding would be 10 minus 5. Okay. Okay, so then we also have other engine sensors, intake uh, temperature sensor, coolant temperature sensor. You'll hear a lot of these IATs, ECTs, etc. Those reference the modifiers for your tuning, okay? They're all 0 to 5 volts. Every sensor inside the car is 0 to 5 volts, okay? And based on the voltage value that's being sent by the sensor, some are variable resistance, some are potentiometers, some are uh, hot wire sensors, whatever. They work different ways, but they give you a voltage. That voltage is then translated by the engine's computer into a value. So two volts on this sensor means the engine is running at 180 degrees. 2.5 volts means it's running at 190 degrees or whatever. All of those sensors in turn modify your calculated load and i think that's the last bombshell i'm going to drop on you guys before we take a break because it might nuke your mind that whole calculation piece so all right now as far as air fuel ratios we 12.1 to 13.1 is your power band what they call rich best torque and lean best torque rich best torque is 12.1 Lean best torque is 13.1. Between those two numbers, is you can, for all intents and purposes, consider it to be a flat line of power. 
Anything in that range just makes all about the same amount of power. We know that <coughs> we know that 14.7 is the most efficient, right? Where all the air marries all the fuel and they live happily ever after and get burned. As you want to make power, okay, some of the what you want to make sure of is that all of your fuel molecules get burned. You care a little bit less what happens to the air, right? So that's why we richen it. We add more fuel to the mixture to make sure that all the fuel molecules find air molecules to burn. And that's why we run richer, to make more power. Uh, past 12.1, as you go richer from 12.1, you are adding so much fuel that you're getting a little bit of quench and you're losing some of your power. Okay? That's just physics. There's no way around it. Uh, oh, I guess I'm getting choppy audio. Yes, it's 12.1 to 13.1, Isaac. Is everybody have, else having audio problems, or am I doing okay? All right. So if it gets too bad, just let me know. Um, like I said, we're probably going to take a, a some kind of a break here. Hopefully, uh, I can reset some internet stuff or something. Um, okay, so 12.1 to 13.1 is your sweet spot. However, when you go forced induction, that will grenade your motor. It's still physically the best spot, but because you have so much higher density, you have to run richer than 12.1 to slow down the flame speed. Which I know sounds completely ironic that you're adding air to make a faster flame speed to make more power, but now you add more fuel to slow the air speed down. But it's just the way it works. The goal is, again, you want that flame speed to be in the very high push category, not into the shatter category. And that's why we add extra fuel. If you add water or meth, or any other cooling agent, you can then run 12.1 AFR because you don't need the extra fuel to cool it down and slow it down. You got something else in there that's doing that for you. The reason why they always say, well, I only run meth for safety or I only run water for safety is because they don't, basically people don't have the guts to run around at 12.1 because they fear that their water system is going to break. If your water system breaks and you don't have that extra fuel, you will have a grenaded engine very quickly. So that's why people they you know, spend the money to get the system and they don't really use it. So I argue that why bother? I can always add more fuel. Gas is relatively inexpensive. Surprisingly, that's still relatively inexpensive. It's cheaper than water. You know, buy it for a gallon. Bottle water costs more than gas. So it's still theoretically better to just add a little extra gas and use that as your as your measure of control. Okay, well let's move. All right, we already went over this, right? All that math. Okay. Well, okay. So when you're tuning uh, forced induction on a, a natural uh, naturally aspirated motor. We got our choice of EMS pretty well down nowadays, right? For us, we need a Cobb or the Mazda Edit, something like that. Um, you want to make sure you address your cooling, your fueling. You have to keep in mind your compression ratio. We don't want to increase a lot of, we don't want to do a lot of pressure increases, right? We want a lot of flow increases, but not a lot of pressure increases for our high compression ratio engine. Uh, we don't have to worry about cams, right? And that stuff. We do have to worry about boost control because we don't have a factory boost control. This is where uh, Ryan gets to win the lottery because he has his SCI, which has a factory boost controller built into the system. He can just use his cob, log in to the SCI, and be like, I want the more boost, pink, done. And it's per load, per RPM, temperature dependent, everything. Very nice. You can't buy that and install it. 
that I've ever heard of, but not as good as the factory one. Uh, if you're running FI on an FI motor, there, Ryan, same thing. You got a choice of EMS, you know, as long as you can uh, don't peg the mass airflow sensor, you can run a cob or something like that on an SCI. Um, obviously, you want to know your top and bottom end limits and whether you're going to use a factory boost control, whether you're going to change out the turbo uh, with something else or just run higher boost on the same turbo, et cetera, et cetera. Um, okay, so now when we talk about tuning for our variable uh, port timing, you have to make sure you take into account that you're going to have these transitions. Those transitions are going to be when the SSV and the APV and the VDI open, right? Whenever you have a transition, you're going to have either a choke point right before it or a lean spot right after it. If you're transitioning too late, you'll see it as a choke point. If you transition too early, you'll see it as sort of a deadline. And if you don't tune for the transition, you'll see the lean spike on your AFRs. And that's the most common one that we see on the RX-8 is a lean spot. Um, the uh, variable runner length versus lift and duration is for the cam guys, which there are none in this class other than Ryan's STI. But there's a cool picture. I like to leave it in and show you guys. You know, we talk about VTEC and all that stuff, making fun of that nonsense. Uh, the way that VTEC works is, you guys know, a camshaft is like a lobe, right? Pushes on your intake and exhaust uh, valves. Well, it's got a certain profile. Can't change it, right? But you want to be able to change it. You want to have longer lift and duration at higher RPMs. So the way it works for VTEC is there's a third lobe that sits in the center, right? It's bigger than the other two. Bigger lift, bigger duration. At a certain RPM, a pin plunges in there and lines up all three of those uh, cam lobes and locks them in. And then as it spins, now the new bigger cam profile is opening up the intake and exhaust valve longer. Okay, so it's relatively ingenious but pretty simple system. Okay, but that's it's sort of like our VDI. It's either on or it's off, right? This picture is really cool because this is actually what Ferrari did. That's a cam profile for a Ferrari engine. And if you notice, it's in the shape of more of a triangle. It's got a, they built 3D cam profiles. So you have your lift and your duration lobe, like you normally see on a regular cam, but from front to back, they're different sizes. The back is bigger than the front. So it has infinitely variable cam profile. As the engine reaches different operating parameters, it actually just shifts the cams forward and backwards. And because it's a it's on a slope, you can get whatever you want. Pretty neat. And that's why they're so expensive. That is correct. That would, yeah, if you don't have to mechanically do it, if you can do it electronically, then yeah, you can have infinite whatever you want. Yeah. Can yeah. you imagine the nightmare that's going to happen when all the punk high school kids try and tune that nonsense? <laughs> Leave them open all the time, man. It'd be awesome. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, other considerations. Uh, we talked about a little bit of the, about the ignition stuff. Um, this specific to the dwell issue, which is near and dear to my heart because I blew up my motor with dwell problems on the first BHR coils. Dwell references the amount of time that it takes to fully charge the coil with enough energy to discharge the spark plug. Coils are big capacitors, that have, some have more time to charge than others. Make sure if you change your ignition that you know what your new dwell requirement is. I'm not necessarily going to have this big huge debate on all the dwell stuff with the cob or whatever. If you know something better than me, then by all means rock on. But what I know is the field manual test for dwell at idle right, is 3.5 milliseconds using an oscilloscope on the factory ignition. 
That's what Mazda says that they want it to be attested. The uh, Yukon GM whatever coils want five milliseconds of duration. So I got two hard numbers. Do the math. Okay, if you want to try a ninja figure out the table, then rock on. That's more power to you. But all I know is what I know. Like I said, that all I know is what I know. Yeah, so if you if you know better than me, then by all means, rock on. Oh, hang on. It was. Oh, yeah, it was like, I was like, when I read it, too, the first time I read it, it was like, but the reaction. Right. Of, yeah. <laughs> like, I, I, because there were some guys chatting about it, too. Just to, to re-reference what I was saying, I know that the factory wants 3.5. I know the GMs want 5 milliseconds. I, have, I do not know for a fact what the numbers in the dwell table mean. Because Cobb, Mazda didn't call me and tell me what it was. So I know that I have this number, and I know that I have this other number. I am going to modify the table by that percentage. If somebody else does something different and it works for them, rock on. I am not an electrician. I don't even own an oscilloscope. I didn't know what one was until I saw the field manual and I had to Google it and see what it was. And I was like, oh, yeah, I know what that is. But that's my level of knowledge. So your results may vary. If you want to use the Altman or whatever his name is uh, dwell table, and it works for you, more power to you. Um, okay, again, we you want to talk about uh, as far as gapping club plugs goes. Um, as we get spark blowout, because of that denser mixture of fuel and air, the air is what matters. But as you get that denser mixture of of air in there, it becomes harder and harder to jump that gap. You can decrease the size of the gap by gapping your plugs differently. Or you can get more powerful ignition. Right? The two basically do the same thing, allow the spark to occur. Okay. The other option you have when you get into a situation where you're generating a lot of power and a lot of heat is to get colder plugs that don't that you, the, the, the amount of heat generated by the plug is slightly less. Therefore, the theory is, is that it will be less like, likely to be a hot spot in the compression chamber and cause pre-ignition. Like an overheated spark plug that's super duper hot, all by itself can ignite all of that fuel even before you want it to. But, I mean, really any hot spot in the engine can do that. Uh, if you ever had an old car that used to diesel on, what they call it, when you turn it off, and it would take a second, blah, 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 and then it finally die, it's because it had a hot spot in there somewhere that was still hot enough to ignite fuel. So that's how diesel engines work, you know what I mean? So if you want to turn your high-performance rotary into a diesel, give it a hot spot. It won't work out very good for you, but it's an option. Um, again, cooling. Oh, hang on. Okay, so F5 force induction uses colder plugs. You got it now, Ryan? And then JB said it was getting cut out and choppy. Uh, what I was talking about, JB, is you can decrease the gap of the plug so that it's easier for the spark to jump across, or you can increase the power of the ignition. When you have very dense air, where you're having trouble lighting the mixture, colder plugs are plugs that burn at a lower temperature in order to attempt to prevent a hot spot inside the compression chamber, which would then potentially cause a pre ignition event. At 425 degrees Fahrenheit, fuel will ignite all on its own. And yes, it does increase the chance of fouling, right? Because if it's colder, then you may get more junk on it. It's not burning as hot. All right, we talked about cooling. Uh, we want to make sure that... Yes, that's correct, JB. Um, 
you want to get the heat out of the engine if you increase the power, right? So you got to think about your water pump, your radiator, your thermostat, uh, and you know, decreasing the load on the engine cooling system. Uh, fouling simply means that there's carbon that builds up so heavy on the spark plug that it no longer generates a reliable spark. So you get a lot of misfires with fouled plugs. And then when you're talking about your, your fueling, you want to make sure you have adequate fuel pressure and adequate fuel flow, as well as that your injectors are the appropriate size for your level of modification. So you guys right now are all motor. Obviously, the factory injectors are fine. Low level of boost, factory injectors are still fine. You start getting into higher and higher levels of horsepower, you're going to want to get bigger injectors. Um, Is there a rough and dirty number or ratio, you think? Say again? Is there a rough and dirty number or ratio for when you think you might need to upgrade? I would say anything more than 300 horsepower at the crank, upgrade your fuel. So about 275-ish at the wheels, somewhere right around there. Uh, and, well, the pump, here's what I recommend for everybody on the fuel pump issue. Autometer makes a really cool gauge, which I had, a fuel pressure gauge, and they have that quick fitting that whoever sells. Um, but the fuel gauge changes color, right? Kind of nexus or whatever. And so I left it blue, like the rest of my gauges, and then if it ever fell below 55, it would turn to green, and if it fell below 50, it would turn red. So it was just an idiot light. Like I could still see what my pressure was. The factory fuel system is designed to run at 60 PSI. I had the factory pump. <coughs> I never fell below 60 PSI, I was good to go. Other people, when they, I seen them, their their uh, boost logs, they'd send them to me, I'm like, woo, you're looking lean, bud. And what's happening is, is as they're boosting, it's the fuel pressure is dropping. Like, oh, yeah, I get down to 45 PSI when I boost. I'm like, oh, you might want to replace that bad boy. So I would rather spend a couple hundred bucks for a monitoring tool that's going to always help you rather than spend a couple hundred bucks to replace a fuel pump that you think is bad when it may not be. Yeah, and then fuel starvation is a bad situation. Uh, uh, I don't actually know how many cc's per minute the fuel pump is rated for. Um, as far as the fuel injectors, you got, I have to do some math on that, you got two primary at 280, and then four, you guys have a calculator here you can, so two primaries at 280, and four others at 380 apiece, what's the total on that? Um, I've just been informed that the Pro Sport fuel pressure gauge beeps. That changes color. So Pro Sport would be another option if you're looking for a fuel gauge. 28. Okay, that's what Ryan said. Yeah, so the, the injectors are good for 2,800 cc's, um, which is good enough to get you probably north of 300. But remember, like we talked about earlier, if you're running at 100% duty cycle, you're going to overheat your injectors and have problems. So you don't want to run them at 100%. As far as the return fuel system, your biggest benefit is that you can put on a rising rate fuel pressure regulator. Because remember, the, a returnless system like the one we have is, as the pressure inside the engine increases from your boost pressure, when the injector opens and you have 60 PSI behind it, 60 PSI of fuel is going to flow differently into a 10 PSI boosted intake than it would into a atmospheric intake, right? It's not linear because it's fluid versus, well, they're both fluids, but, you know, it's a more dense liquid, blah, blah, blah. I don't want to get all crazy with it, but it's just different. However, if you get a rising rate fuel regulator, you plug in a, a boost pressure hose to it. For every pound of, of boost pressure that you generate, the fuel pressure goes up one pound. So it keeps it all in line. It's a nice thing to have. But that's only if you have a return fuel system. 
All right, so to answer your question, Ryan, about the uh, return system. All right, so planning for a tuning session. We talked about rich best torque and lean best torque. Uh, detonation versus pre-ignition. Detonation is an uncontrolled explosion on the power stroke while the chamber is expanding, okay? Pre-ignition is an uncontrolled explosion while the chamber is compressing still. Okay, so pre-ignition is very, very bad. Detonation is only kind of bad. Now the backfire. Okay. Um, we talked about spark blowout right from the dense air. A little bit different than a misfire. A misfire is just when the, either due to fouling or whatever, right, the spark plug fails to fire. The ignition system just got something going on with it. Or the fuel mixture is too rich. Sometimes you add too much fuel in there and get misfires, and it kind of gives you that, like, I call it the fat pedal feeling, where it's just like a little bit over here, a little bit of burbling in the exhaust, and it just kind of feels like a thicker gas pedal. Spark blowout is, again, when you're you're boosting so much that it's just blowing the spark out from the air density, and that will feel a lot more like a... You guys ever been in a, a factory turbocharged car and hit, like, boost cut or fuel cut? In a no, it's like a wall. It just turns off. You know what I mean? So you're driving and you're in it because you're boosting, obviously, right? You get your foot in there and it just like, whoop, and you just lose it. I and mean, then it'll catch. You know, it's not like it dies, but it just hits. It's like hitting a wall, and then it'll drop back down, and then it'll start working again. Because the spark plugs work, they just got blown out by the air pressure. All right. Uh, make sure when you start tuning, you set realistic goals. We talked about that before, right? Don't chase the don't chase the dragon. And, well, not only that, but here, here's what ends up happening. And because I'm a, a relatively realistic guy, I, I see it coming and I kind of plan for it. But, like, it's not my car. I do, do I tune people's cars? And they're like, oh, I want a dyno. I want 350 horsepower. Like, I'll get 350 horsepower out of that car. It's not mine. I don't care. Yeah. I'm just telling you so that right now we're going to start and it's going to be what it is and then we're going to keep ramping it up. And if you keep telling me to ramp it up, then I'll ramp it up. But just keep that in mind when you start. Don't set a horsepower goal right now, you know. And invariably, I've had plenty of 400 horsepower cars that we stopped around 330 horsepower because they were like hitting that dyno, you know what I mean? And they're pulling, and it sounds like the world's gonna end. And then they let off the gas, and it shoots six foot flames and stuff. And I'm like, all right, let's turn. You want to turn the boost up to 14 psi? And they're like, uh, no, nah, I think we'll leave it be. Okay. <laughs> But you know, but if you if you have a number set in ahead of time, then you you run into some issues. Um, I prefer to do a baseline pull on the dyno before I do anything that I know is a safe tune at a low boost setting usually, like factory boost, eight psi, seven psi. Then go from there. But if you start off with say eight psi and you're at 240 horsepower at the wheels. And at 10 PSI, you're at 200 and, say, 75 horsepower at the wheels, right? That's a very good improvement in power, right, for that number of PSI. Do you realistically think that you can get another 25 horsepower, you know, with another 2 PSI? Probably not. You're probably going to need another 6 or 7 PSI on that turbo to get that power. So if you know that going into it, you're like, well, I'm not cranking this thing up to 16 PSI. It's not going to happen. So then you just walk away. All the good. Have realistic goals. All right. Make sure you change. Know what you can change. Change one thing at a time. Always, always, always change one thing at a time. Measure. Then change one other thing. Okay? Don't go chasing around all the different stuff. Um, the... The question was asked on an FI motor, do you give a safe baseline? No. There's really no such thing as a safe baseline tune on an FI motor. Meaning that when you force, do force induction, you have to tune everything that's not force induction first, and then you sort of slowly work your way up into the force induction side. 
Because if you have everything scaled correctly, if you have your mass airflow sensor scaled, if you have your injector scaled, if you have your VMAP built correctly, then any changes that happen in boost should be minor. If you haven't done that correctly, and then the first time you go into boost and you see AFRs of, you know, 14 to 1, that's a bad day waiting to happen, right? So you change small stuff at the beginning and work your way out, take your time. All right. This is the one I'm going to we're gonna do this one right here, and then we're going to take a break, guys. Uh, this, well, the next two, basically. This is what's going to blow some people's mind. All right. Everyone here, with the exception of the STI, has a mass airflow-based tuning system. The STI has a combination mass airflow and manifold absolute pressure, MAP versus MAF. Okay. The load is the mass of the air ingested divided by the mass of the air that is capable when modified by the throttle. <coughs> so, absolute load is the air of the mass ingested divided by the maximum air at wide open throttle at 100% volumetric efficiency. All right, so what you have is a mass airflow-based tuning system, which is a fixed volume variable mass air pump. It's always 80 cubic inches, but it is not always capable of 80 cubic inches of air at 80 degrees Fahrenheit, which is 100% load, right? So what ends up happening is your fixed volume variable mass engine uses the uh, barometric pressure sensor, the intake air temperature sensor, to modify what 100% load actually is. So 100% load in Las Vegas right now is a lower number of grams per second of air than 100% load here in Seattle is. Same engine, same car, same everything. Different molecules of air. But it needs the definition of load for fueling purposes and for timing purposes, even though it's sort of a moving target. It has modifiers. So as the load goes up, because you're in denser Seattle air, it needs to add more fuel and timing, right? So everybody kind of tracking how that works? So even though a mass airflow sensor is a hot wire sensor that measures the mass of the air going into it, independent of any other variables. A mass airflow sensor does 100% of the measurement of the air going into your engine. The other sensors modify what 100% load is for that engine at that moment. Make sense? All right, let's see if I nuked anyone's brain. Uh, on the thing here. Uh, that, that's the point, right? And you don't have to recalibrate the mass airflow sensor if you do it right. Um, if, you, if you properly modify and scale everything, temperature, pressure, all that stuff, all of those modifications to load should happen seamlessly. You should not have to recalibrate. The only time you recalibrate your mass air flow sensor is when you get a new air intake. Now, if you have a manifold absolute pressure sensor, it depends on how old the car is, to be honest with you. The older ones, the FDs and stuff, those do need to be recalibrated at different altitudes. But the newer ones, they, they have their own modification tables that work pretty good for them as well. Okay. <laughs> Yes, if the different air intake has the same inner diameter, you still have to recalibrate the mass airflow sensor because the mass airflow sensor is a little tall, small, tiny little circle thing sitting somewhere in that intake track. It doesn't measure all of the air. It takes a sample. 
So every air intake is going to flow differently. Even if it's the same size, the flow is different. You got to make sure that your mass airflow sensor is adequately measuring the airflow. How do you calibrate that? Oh, we'll get into that during the tuning stuff. Yeah, there's a way to do it. All right. Any more questions? Okay. I'm going to skip the piggyback unless anyone wants to learn about piggyback. Speak now or forever hold your peace. Three, two, one. Okay. Stand alone. Anybody need to know? Three, two, one. Okay. All right. So, our PCM flashing. All right. We're going to override our stock settings. We're going to scale the sensors and load correctly. All right. We got to know how our tables interact. And we know that we can't go, there's certain limits to the PCM flashing, right? Now, we don't have to worry so much about the bricking the ECU thing anymore. That's pretty much gone away. But there are limits to how much adjustability you have, right? You'll never have a factory boost controller if you don't have a boosted car to begin with. You cannot go past five volts on the mass airflow sensor, so then you end up having to get a bigger pipe. You know, on a three and a half inch pipe, you're limited to 400 grand per second of air or so, I'm right around there. <laughs> it's just the way it is. You gotta get a bigger pipe. Uh, Mazda Edit is a PCM flasher. Yes, that is correct. Mazda Edit works the same way as the Cobb Access Port. Okay, so we talked about the load, right? Now I'm going to show you this video, and I'm going to try and talk through it, and we'll see how many questions we get. Okay, so what we got here is our mass airflow table, right? We're going to get the voltage off the sensor. It's going to give us the grams per second of air. Then it's going to go and it's going to look up on my load limit, right? Making sure that my calculated load is not over the load limit. Then it's going to go to the bare metric compensation, modify the compensation. Then it's going to go to the high air intake compensation table, compensate the number once again. Then it's going to go up to my fuel VE table and look at what my modifier is based on the fuel VE. So our now we've got most of the numbers to figure out calculated load, right? So now I have all these numbers to give me my calculated load. Then it's going to go to my base air fuel table, look at what the target AFR is. Once it has that target AFR, it will take my actual AFR and give me my short-term fuel trim. So what that video showed you was how the tables interact for the cob. If you look at the right-hand side, what it was showing you is that you know what your load is, 100%. Your displacement is 80 cubic inches. If you measure grams per second of 52.5, at 2,000 RPMs, it's going to go to that load limit table, right? It's going to see a 0.76 there, meaning that it won't believe you that you were at 100% load. It's going to automatically knock that number down to 0.76. Then it's going to go to the barometric compensation, multiply that 0.76 by 1. The IAT compensation table, multiply that point, or whatever that result is, which in this case is 0.76, by 1.02. Then it's going to multiply that number by 0.99 for my fuel VE compensation. So the final calculated load is going to be 0 0.76744448. Then it's going to go to my target AFR table. For that RPM and that load, it's going to go look at what my target AFR is. My target AFR is 14.7. My measured AFR from the wideband O2 sensor was 14.5. So my short-term fuel trim for that one engine cycle is negative 1.37. <coughs> if that happens enough times, then my short-term fuel trim will then become a long-term fuel trim of negative 1.37. So that's how it works. Uh, 
Switch back to just the PowerPoint. Uh, yeah, I think I can do that. That better, uh, Ryan? I can't get my thing back. There we go. Okay, let me go back to it then. Okay. That's what they were seeing, so I had to switch around. Okay, so uh so basically all right, that that's how the load is calculated. And then you get your short term fuel trims. Enough of those develop long term fuel trims. So what we do in tuning for these Cobb PCM type tuners is we have to put the engine in a solid state so that we have enough of these cycles take place that we can trust the information coming from them so we can make tuning adjustments based on our, our desired to our target amount. That's the sole secret of the process. Now you still got to do math for your AFRs and all that stuff, but the math or NA is real easy, right? 12.1. You want to be a little bit richer for safety, in case you get the bad gas, which is a good idea, right? Sometimes you get bad gas. Then yeah, run around 11.8, 11.9, right? But when you look at the factory map on the RX-8, they're running like 10.4. And that is all there to save the catalytic converter. So you don't have a cat, you don't care, nuke that thing, whatever, run it 11.8, 12.1, some right around there, done, too easy. For the forced induction guys, is a little bit more nuanced. You kind of want to be a little bit lower, 11.3, 11.4, dipping down into the high 10s without actually causing misfire, right? The timing's a little more complicated. We're going to go into that in a little bit. But the basic process of how these maps interrelate is the key thing to understand so that you can see where all your modifiers are. All right, any questions from the... Uh, the web people, before we move on. You have a question, Ryan? Go for it. You guys getting hungry, though? A little burnout. Okay. Um, Ryan wants to know how does the ECU compensate when the AFR is below 11.8 and the O2 sensor cannot read it? Actually, it can read it to 11.2. But to answer your question, it does not compensate for it. When in those areas on the map, when it's showing richer than 11.18, it is an open loop. And an open loop. It does not get any kind of feedback to build fuel trims. It simply assumes whatever AFR it was given is the AFR that it's getting, right? So there is no feedback. There's no reality check on open loop, only on closed loop. And that changes how we tune because we want to use closed loop. We want to use the fuel trims. In open loop, you have to make your own fuel trims. Okay. Uh, I'm going to propose that we take a food break. How long do it take to get this grub? All right. How, about, how do you guys online feel about a 45-minute food break? It's uh, one o'clock here, so we're getting a little hungry. Yeah, 45 minutes will work for you guys. Okay, perfect, dinner time for Ryan. All right, so let's do 45 minutes. Um, in the event that this thing goes crazy again and fries itself, just re-find me on TeamViewer and we'll try that part all over again, okay? Where's my screen sharing thing? Uh, yes, at 1.45 our time, Ryan.
Hey, hey everybody, we're back. Do we got everybody online pretty much? All right. Antavius is back. Cool. Mm -hmm. All right, I think we got everybody. Someone's got a hot mic, though. All right. We were a little bit late because we were talking about guns. Another another perfectly healthy man hobby. Bass cars and guns. And yeah, next we'll be talking about women and we'll start drinking here fairly shortly. Um, all right, guys. So yeah, we'll just pass out on the couch, man. Um, so we talked about how load was calculated just as a real quick recap. Um, before I move on, does anybody have any questions that occurred to them during lunch that we've covered so far? Are we ready to move? All right, I will take your silence as consent. Oh, somebody have a question? Yeah, Kane, um, I was just wondering about the um, actual, uh, sorry, no, the target AFR uh, read from the OBD. Um, is that um, before or after trims are applied? I had you muted. My bad. Um, hey, as far as uh, afterward, not a problem. Um, I'll just give you guys my phone number, and you can shoot me a text or whatever. Uh, can I get uh, Jay Cundy to repeat the question? I didn't quite hear it. Sure. Uh, just looking at the um, target AFR. Uh, that comes out of the OBD when you do your logging. I was just wondering if that is before or after the trims have been applied. Gotcha. Good question. The uh, AFR that you read out of the logs is the actual AFR after all of the trims and everything have been applied. It's a direct measurement from the exhaust. Yeah, yeah so sorry, I, I don't mean that. Use... I mean the, uh, the target AFR is in uh, okay. what the PCM is telling um, the engine to run. Gotcha. The, the target AFR is doesn't really require the fuel trims because the fuel trims affect only the actual AFR. So if you have a COB or any ODB2 reader that is capable of reading the target AFR, that's simply the number that comes off of the target AFR table based on your load and your RPM. Okay. Um, the reason I ask is because I did some um, logging with some flat tables where I just had 13 as the target AFR across the tables and the uh, VE table was flat on one and uh, the target AFR I got logged from the uh, Mazda edit logging was not 13.0 it was a different number something like 14.8 or something like that and I think this might have been after the trims had been applied to it. Well no no if you're in closed loop there is another table called closed loop target AFR which you would then have to modify. So if you wanted to just test it, you'd have to use the closed loop target AFR table. I'm pretty sure it was open loop because I was running fourth gear at 60 miles per hour. And the uh, short term fuel trims were very close to zero, like uh, 0.16 or whatever it is. They were at 0.16. Then, yeah, that's. Good question. I've actually never really seen that uh, being an issue. Um, 
So you're saying that you were definitely an open loop and you had your target AFR set at 13.1 and you were still seeing 14.7? Yeah, I mean, the measured was uh, pretty close to 13, like I was trying to get to um, after the long-term fuel trims had been set. But um, what was coming back from the OBD is the, uh, it might have been calculated AFR, but it, it was before it goes through the engine. It wasn't from the um, the um, exhaust gas uh, uh, sensor. Yeah, that's the part I guess I'm, I'm just confused about. Because the command AFR or the target AFR, when you're in closed loop is always going to be very close to 14.7. Um, when you're in open loop, it should be whatever that target AFR table is uh, that you set. So I guess if you want to try to replicate the situation and uh, we can take a look at it offline some other time and see if we can figure out what the deal is. But as a general rule, the short-term and long-term fuel trims should not change your target AFR ever. Sure. Okay. Uh, yeah, well, let's take it offline anyway, or uh, I'll do some experimenting and figure it out. Okay, yeah, sounds good. And uh, if you can replicate it and give me a log, I'd like to see it for sure, so we can see if we can figure out what's going on with it. All right, any other questions? You guys good? Okay, let's go ahead and move along then. All right, so we talked a little bit about this already as far as uh, kind of a step-by-step -step tuning guide. Uh, first thing we're going to do, we're going to calibrate and we're going to scale all of our sensors, which includes includes the injectors. They're not really a sensor, but we just we scale them at the same time. Uh, the specific process that we do to follow that, which I'll uh, we'll probably get into here, um, a little bit more detail later on this afternoon here in about 30 minutes or so, but you're going to identify the different areas that you can control to get down to one single variable. All right, the problem that we have and the reason why the piston guys got a little bit of a layup on this is that we have multiple injectors per rotor. So when you, for example, normally you first by start off by scaling the mass airflow sensor. Once you scale the mass airflow sensor, you're pretty much done at that point because you only got one injector and nothing else is going to jump in there and act weird on that vehicle. We have multiple injectors. So you scale the mass airflow sensor, which is your one single variable that you're working on at that time. But when that second injector starts in, it throws all your variables out of whack. So you have to get your injector number one done first, then your mass airflow sensor then you do injector number two, then you do injector number three. So our process of scaling sensors takes a lot longer. Um, now, in, there should be in the file box. Let me just see if that, it's not. All right, hang on one second, guys. I'm going to put some of these files in this file box so you can sort of play around with this thing. Maybe let's try it again. Work. All right, well, we'll look at it. Um, as far as at the end of this whole process, um, I'll make sure I get all your guys' emails and I'll be able to farm all this stuff out to you or I'll put it out in Dropbox or something. But, uh, okay, so here we go. We got our, our uh, mass airflow sensor. Now, at idle, we know that we average about 5.5 grams per second of air at idle. So what you do is you sort of set this up in such a way that you get a, a voltage band from your idle and you get your target your actual figure out your percent difference and then you'll see where it says your actual grams per second on this document 
that's what we're going to modify it by, right? So you've got your, you know, 0 0.2, 0 0.1, so on, so on, so on, all these little different variations, and you go back and you scale your mass error flow sensor. All right, but we're going to do it a little bit differently on ours because by virtue of experience and the fact that nobody's radically changed their intake, you can, you don't have to be this detailed. You don't have to go through every single voltage variation. We can do it kind of in chunks, okay? So what we'll do when we first start doing our mass airflow scaling is we're going to scale the idle. All right, and we know that at idle, we, op we operate typically right around five and a half grams per second. So this little box right here on the cob, that everybody, can everybody see this? Okay, so that little area is your, typically where everybody's gonna idle, okay? So right around five and a half grams per second, right around 1.21 volts, okay? Something very close to that. If this, and the only reason why we know this is just by virtue of experience, right? 99% of any unmodified stock RX-8 that I've ever logged idle is in that range. So, for example, if you have factory injectors, but you've done some aftermarket ignition, uh, air intake, and you see that you're not idling at 5.5 grams per second, it's pretty easy to determine which item it is that you need to change. Right, so we're going to change this. Now, when you change the mass airflow curve, you change the cell that you're modifying and everything else to the right of it. Okay, so if I needed to change this, I would click that. Oops. Okay, click that cell right there. I would go all the way to the end, click the last cell, maybe. Why are you missing me? Okay, I highlight all the cells like that, and then I would change them all. Even though I'm only tracking the one 5.45 one, I'm going to change them all, okay? Then, so let's say I modify these by 10%. I'm going to make them all 10% higher. Okay, bam. Now, later on in the process, we realize that we have another mass airflow sensor issue that we need to resolve. Instead of just, we're not gonna change the whole thing, obviously, right, because that made this area good to go. So now later on, if we have to change it at 1.41 volts, then we do the same thing. We just change the 1.41 all the way up to 4.88. So we'll multiply that by 1 point, you know, whatever, 0 0.2, we're gonna add two more percent to that. So that's generally how that process works. We always move left to right, higher voltages, if we have to change the mass airflow sensor. Hopefully, if you don't have a very radically designed air intake, once you change it idle, you're pretty much done. You shouldn't really have to make too many more mass airflow changes. Okay? Now, if we are idling very, very close to 5.5 grams per second of air, Oh, yeah, good point, Ryan. Don't ever change these two guys right here, these far left ones. It'll trip a check engine light. It'll give you a mass airflow sensor uh, code. I think it's mass airflow sensor voltage too low or something like that. So just leave it be. Okay, so now we're let's say we didn't change the mass airflow sensor at all, right? Our car is idling, and we're reading right around 5.5 grams per second of air, and our fuel trims are off we know that we have to change injector one. So that's the one area where you just sort of have to trust experience on this, okay? If you have a heavily bridge ported, you know, a crazy, really, really radical engine, the system may not work. You may have to play around with it a little bit more. But even if you're doing like a supercharger or anything, at least run the stock map idle-wise long enough to be able to scale your mass airflow sensor. If you want to run at 1,000 RPM or whatnot, 
rock on. By all means, go ahead and do that. But before you bump up the RPMs, make sure that you're adjusting your at the stock level with the stock everything to get your mass airflow scale where it needs to be. All right. Uh, Ryan asked if we always start with the mass airflow sensor and move to the injectors. Yes and no. Again, like I was saying, if your reported airflow is very close to 5.5, 5.5 grams per second of air, and your fuel trims are off, you want to go ahead and modify your injector. You only modify the mass airflow sensor if your reported airflow value differs from 5.45. Answer your question there, Ryan. Okay. All right, so now what I want to do, we're going to do a real quick practice exercise on scaling the mass airflow sensor. All right, so I'm going to see if I can find an idle log real quick. I don't think these are it. Okay. All right, so we're just going to use uh, this dialog real quick. All right, everybody see this? Okay, so here's our, our log at idle. Again, fully warmed up, all that kind of stuff. Okay, some of the things that you want to kind of do, I always, at least for me, it always seems to reset. Make sure that your uh, your little Excel thing here is set to average. It makes your life a little bit easier rather than having to manually do it. All right, so all you got to do for idle is look at your short-term fuel trim. The average is negative 6.6. .6. Everybody see that? Down there at the bottom. Might be hard to see on the... Everybody see this number right here? Okay, so we'll take our negative 6.6, .6, okay, and then obviously your long-term fuel trim is negative 0 0.6, so it's basically zero, all right? Now we look at our mass airflow, and we're averaging at 7.4, okay? So what we're seeing here is we are over-reporting our airflow away from our 5.5, .5, all right? It just seems suspect. How much are we over-reporting? Well, roughly 6.6%. Because that's what our short-term fuel trim is. If we had a short-term fuel trim and a long-term fuel trim, we would take the two numbers and average them together. Okay? So in this particular case, using this example, we would then go back to our voltage range, which is here. It's 1.265. We would go back to 1.265, so right around here-ish, okay? And we would highlight this whole range on our mass airflow sensor, press the M key, which stands for multiply, and we would type 0.94, right? Because we want to decrease it by 6%. Granted, 6.5, but whatever. And we'll make that change. Then we go back and we re-log the idle and try to get the short-term and long-term fuel trims as close to zero as possible and our airflow as close to 5.5 as possible. Okay. If the airflow had said 5.5 and we had a negative six fuel trim, we would adjust injector bank number one. And if we had to adjust injector bank number one, we would do that right here. 
same thing. We would hit M for modify, and we would type 0.96, right? It's going to reduce the number. Oh, wait, the way around. I always get the one backwards. All right, so if you have to reduce the amount of fuel when you're modifying your injectors, you actually increase the size of your injectors. If you have to reduce the amount of fuel in any other map, you use a number smaller than one. Does that make sense? I know I always, I always get it wrong the first time. If you make the injector bigger, it will have the net result of the computer not opening it as long because it will think that it's a larger. Right, it'll reduce the amount of time that it's open, therefore reduce the amount of fuel going into it. So in this case, if I'm off by 6%, I would type in my 1.06. Maybe. 1.06 and hit enter, which will increase the number, thereby decreasing the amount of time that the injector is open. Okay, uh, we got some audio issues here. If the mass airflow sensor was 5.5-ish, we would only focus on bank one scaling. That is correct, Ryan. If your mass airflow is right around 5.5, you are only going to be changing the injector bank one. And then, Isaac, what part did you get cut out on? Okay. If you need, if your fuel trims are negative and you need to remove fuel, you are going to scale the injector larger. So in this case, we are 6% too rich. We're going to make the injector 6% bigger. By making the injector larger, it will be open for a shorter period of time. Okay. Now, once we have done our idle, we are then going to drive the car in 500 RPM bands from 1,500 to 4,000 RPMs. Okay? That is the closest way to duplicate. Oh, wrong one. That is the closest way to duplicate this mass airflow table here without driving yourself absolutely insane. Okay, so we know that from 1,500 to 4,000 RPMs, the only two variables that we have are the mass airflow sensor and injector bank number one. Okay, now, remember, the injector doesn't grow and shrink on its own. Right. If you have the injector scales correctly or not, it's going to be the same all over the place. Right. It's only one number that you can change. Your mass airflow sensor is changes by voltage. So, for example, we get our idle done right. We think we're good to go. We do our 1,500 to 4,000 RPM range. And all of those ranges are off by exactly 3%. What variable should we be adjusting? Well, if they're all exactly the same, if you're off by the exact same percentage, and you're reading 5.45, 5.5 grams per second at idle, what's the most likely culprit? Injector. The injector, right? Because the injector doesn't change anything. It's all, so the trend analysis that you're doing is based on, the, on all of those pieces of data, right? So if you're constantly off, and it, it, obviously it won't be exact, because none of this is, we can never get down to zero. But if you're off by 3% in each of these things, then Yes, you would be modifying your injector by 0.97 if you were 
uh, lean, and 1.03 if you were 3% rich, right? If same scenario, okay, and you're off by, let's say, 3% at 1,500, 4% at 2,000, 5% at 2,500, and 6% at 3,000, what's the most likely the problem? Yep. Just like when we're talking long distance marksmanship, right? If you're off a little bit down low, you're gonna be off a lot more far away, right? Same concept. Now, what Ryan asks here is what if it's uh, erratically off? Either you're having some sort of mechanical issue maybe an electrical issue, um, or could be like there, or your fuel VE map is off. 